Let us start. It is my pleasure to introduce KG Odun from CMI. He works on LIGO uh, uh, and neutron star, neutron star merger. And today he is going to tell us the story of recent detection of a double neutron star merger. So, and thank you all for coming today. Okay, and thanks, thanks the speaker uh, <laughs> for crossing our IMSC lake. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, so it's a, you know, thanks for the invitation. It's always uh, great to be uh, here. So I'm going to talk, as Manjiri said, about the recent detection of uh, binary neutron star merger. And uh, I will explain the detection and the context in which it is important, as well as the multiband electromagnetic follow-ups which happen, which is what makes it quite different from the usual binary black hole detections, and try to see that what is it that the joint observations have uh, have given information about. So, as a, just a quick thing, gravitational waves are something predicted by any relative strict theory of gravitation. So, of course, GR. And is if you think about massive dynamical motion of masses, just like how the accelerating charges radiate electromagnetic waves, uh, where dynamical motion of masses uh, will produce gravitational waves, which in the space-time sense could be seen as ripples in the space-time in a very intuitive sense. This is um, been predicted by Einstein uh, long ago, I mean like 100 years ago, and it was in 2015 that uh, LIGO, which is a dedicated uh, experiment aimed to detect uh, such uh, very minute uh, ripples on the space-time, detected it. So what is shown here is a binary black hole merger. So what happens is that you've got two black holes which go around each other, which lose energy in gravitational waves, and they come closer as they lose energy and eventually merge to form a single black hole. And the signal that was detected in LIGO on uh, September 15, uh, 14, uh, 2015 is this one. This is the uh, this is the first detection of uh, direct detection of a binary black hole merger. And uh, the, for this detection recent this year, uh, three of the LIGO, uh, LIGO lead people who developed and uh, led the collaboration uh, got Nobel Prize um, uh, last, uh, uh, last month. So this is about binary black holes. And uh, just to uh, recap, so what happens again is that you've got uh, two black holes, which as I said, loses energy as they, uh, as they in spiral. And as they, as they lose energy, they come closer, then it emits even faster. So what is shown here is a waveform, uh, the, the late stages of the waveform, where you can see that it is a sinusoid, uh, depending upon the orbital motion. And as it comes, you can see the amplitude of the signal increases as it comes uh, closer and closer, as you would expect when the uh, when, uh, as you expect when the, uh, uh, when the emission is stronger. So this is the Im important thing about such a system is that uh, you can actually model the entire dynamics uh, using Einstein's theory. So the early part, when you can approximate it with a slow motion, weak field type of a thing, when they're sufficiently far apart, you use post-Newtonian approximation. But when they come sufficiently close by and close to the merger, when this extremely strong gravity effects takes in, you cannot apply any perturbation methods anymore. So you have to really solve Einstein's equation numerically. And that is what is done by numerical relativity. And once a new object is formed as a result of the merger, you, it may be a deformed object, and it sort of uh, radiates away uh, the gravitational waves settling down to the rotating black hole geometry. And that is like a damn sinusoid, which is, again, analytically modelable, because you can think of uh, deformed black holes to be, you know, and you can do black hole perturbation theory. So this is the important thing is that you can compute the waveforms uh, almost through all phases uh, analytically or numerically. And uh, so no a priori what is a signal to be expected. So such signals, you know, once emitted, uh, this kind of thing can be detected on this long detector. So these are three detectors, two LIGO detectors, uh, which are actually four kilometer long arm length. Um, this is four and this is three. These are the two one in the US and this is the one in Europe. And they are basically L-shaped interferometers, very similar to what we do on a tabletop, but it's very long. And they're aimed to detect uh, such, uh, such very minute, and it's a very weak signal, and they are, uh, they are uh, sophisticated enough to really detect uh, such, uh, minute, uh, uh, such minute signals. So I'm just giving so bunny black holes. You know, we after the first detection, which is here, we have detected many more after that. So you can see, you know, the uh, typically the signal duration is a direct measure of the mass involved. So you, you can see that the most massive ones are the first one uh, is the first one, and then you know, they in the spectrum. The 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 one which is uh, the small smallest mass uh, is the one which gives you uh, this long duration one. And there are you know there are a few more. There are like uh, four detection with two LIGOs. And uh, recently, Virgo, which is a European one, also reached a sensitivity that will uh, help the detection. So that is uh, you know, the last one, which is the 170814, which was announced a few weeks earlier, uh, was, uh, was the joint detection, including two LIGO detector and the Virgo detector. 
And what is shown here is the masses, as I said. So you can see that the masses in this uh, range is, are the typical masses expected from the X-ray binaries because electromagnetically observing the X-rays uh, uh, from the accretion disk, you can get estimate of the masses. There are candidate uh, candidate black holes. The masses of them have always been less than 20 solar mass, let's say. That is a typical ballpark. But the LIGO black holes, whatever we have seen so far, are consistently much higher mass. So that you know, they, they may be, it may be. It may be giving us some information about um, uh, uh, maybe either a different way of forming it or that there is an observational bias in both cases uh, towards uh, for different reasons. But the only thing to keep in mind is that the, the electromagnetic observations were talking about stellar mass black holes to be of the order of uh, t less than 20 solar mass, but all the, almost all the LIGO black holes have, go, have been much more massive uh, than what uh, we have uh, seen in the X-rays. So now coming back to neutron stars, black holes are only you know, uh, is like uh, only one of the end states of the star. So the neutron stars are another uh, way of, I mean, another product of at the end stage of a star when the massive star exhausts its fuel and sort of implodes. And uh, the typically neutron star, loosely speaking, is like you uh, know the entire mass of the sun is compressed into uh, typically 10 to 15 kilometers, which is extremely dense, uh, you know, extremely dense object. And you know the usual annoying example is that if you take if you could take a teaspoon, it would weigh like a Mount Everest, which shows uh, you know, uh, how dense it is. And it is the magnetic fields involved are extremely high, uh, 10 raised to 12 Gauss, and they are observed as you know this is an artistic artistic impression about a pulsar. So pulsar, are, you know, they we see it as pulsar. This is the kind of emission from a from a neutron star, and it is it will be rotating on its axis. So whenever the this uh, thing crosses our line of sight, we see it. So that is how we detected it. And you know we have seen many pulsars. I mean I don't know how uh, uh, how many in our galaxy. It is a very routine thing that we can uh, now detect them uh, quite routinely. But they are very important uh, important objects and have got their own uh, things. And only one thing is so the exact composition about the details about how uh, I mean, the equation of state and so on are not very well known because uh, or, uh, because what we see is either light uh, from this and we have to do indirect methods to get an idea about uh, what they are composed of. So now there's only one, you know, there's only one neutron star. If you could have two neutron stars, like a binary black hole, so that is what is shown here. This is if you have two neutron stars going around each other. So now, the, since unlike black holes, which cannot emit in electromagnetic waves, if you have got two neutron stars going around each other, it should be emitting light with some periodic behavior, which should be detectable, and that is what was detected. So even if you know the early uh, stages when they go around each other was detected by these two gentlemen uh, in <coughs> 1974, I suppose. And they got Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize in 1993. So what is shown here is that when you, if you watch the, uh, if you monitor the period of the binary, because uh, we say you know if there is, if uh, it is losing energy, it is supposed to uh, come closer and closer. So you'd expect the period to change. It's a measure of the orbital period. So what is shown here is the observation up to 2005. Of course, you know this goes much beyond when they were given Nobel Prize, um, uh, showing how the decay of the orbital period is. That is a solid curve according to GR. And the dots are showing uh, the uh, the data points. So you can see that the decay of the orbit uh, of a binary neutron star follows almost exactly what is the prediction of GR. And any deviation from that you know, could be used to bound, for example, any prediction uh, of any deviation from GR. So this is just an example of showing that this, of course, you know, the, you're talking about still early stages when they're going around each other well before the merger. But one interesting question to ask would be that you know, if such systems exist, we detected so many of them after that. If uh, these systems exist in the uh, exist in, in, in nature, there will be some th something which will merge, and uh, the merger of them should be giving us interesting insight about uh, the late stages of their dynamics. So it was a soon after this detection we knew that such systems should exist in uh, nature. Some of them will be m m m merging and giving out signals, gravitational waves, just like how the binary black hole was, and uh, it will be interesting to detect these systems. So. I think the historically, uh, the Hull stellar pulsar played a very uh, prominent role in getting uh, going with the LIGO detection because you know uh, we will fund something which uh, for detecting something which we know exists and you know we can talk about the late stages can be detected, as well as the modeling because it was clear that the gravitational waves are very weak signals and in order to detect them you would need to do the modeling accurately and so the analytical efforts to calculate the waveforms using positive approximation up to very high accuracy was also triggered uh, by the american and the european groups uh, followed following upon the detection of the hull stellar pulsar so hull stellar pulsar has got a very important role uh, in the in the history of gravitational waves 
so now as i told you the we we are looking for uh, something like a binary black you know, something like a binary black hole but now with neutron stars which are like the late stages of a hulse tail like system and there are two problems here so first of all the signal is in general weak the gravitational waves are very weak but on top of it you know, the mass uh, compared to the binary black hole signal the signal strength will go with mass so it will be uh, you know if this have more mass you think it will be signal strength will be higher so since the neutron stars may have a mass of around 1.4 into 1 into 2 let's say and it's going to be much weaker than the first black hole we detected which had a total mass of around 60 so it's going to be much dimmer so what that means that what that means is that for a given sensitivity we will be able to see the systems up to very small distances you know uh, depending, depending upon um, the mass so that was another thing that you know we expect that the the first detection may not be uh, the uh, the binary neutrons so unless they happen to be so frequent and you know uh, so uh, the uh, even uh, even close by there are so many of them so there is, these are two issues, and uh, the way to look for uh, such, uh, such signal is the following. So what you do in data analysis is that when there's a weak signal, if you know exactly the waveform that to ex expect from a such system, you can use the, you know, this example of showing what is called match filtering, where you use the prior knowledge about the details of a signal, the, the facing and the amplitude of a signal, and which is of course buried in the noisy data but once you cross correlate uh, various copies of this waveform known as templates you can detect so I'd, I mean, if there is a signal you would expect a peak when they when the signal and the, the signal in the data and the template that you are sliding over is in phase so that is very intuitive picture about how, uh, how you use match filtering but it's very clear that you know um, the uh, detecting them that is how much the how much it stands above the, uh, above the threshold crucially depends upon uh, the uh, the detail so you need a very accurate model of the waveform in order to uh, use uh, match filtering very efficiently to detect such signal this is of course used for black holes also but for neutron stars also same method is employed because the signal is a very uh, very weak signal in the noisy data yeah so suppose the signal that you generate from some model system that you have yeah the, let's say the uh, rotation period or masses are only slightly different yes Okay, so signal will differ only slightly. Yes. What is the resolution of in the match filtering can distinguish sources which are signals are very close? Yeah, so I think there are two things. Uh, the match filtering is used for detection. So, uh, so the match filtering might give you an approximate idea about what is M1 and M2 spins and so on. That is not what you quote as a as a parameter estimation parameter estimation now you take only this data this stretch of data and uh, do uh, you know uh, you compute a likelihood surface and so on so there uh, is a different method altogether and you know the, uh, that again depending upon the noise and so on it will the the you know uh, the signal strength and the noise and, and the glitchiness of the data it could be uh, it could be different but match filtering is not used to do the parameter estimation it's only for detection so it, it will give you some rough idea but it could be totally so off Yes, exactly. So I think match filtering will give you, give you some general thing, but you know what will be you know, the actual final estimation could be giving you one among them. Could we get it wrong? It could be wrong. I mean, I, there, there is no guarantee that M1 and M2, if you take one uh, from then, uh, it need not be. The, it could be totally off. But I think. So what I mean is, match filtering has detected something. Yes. And the detection itself is false. No, no, that, uh, that is unlikely. No, no. So what match filtering will do is that it will detect. So what it tries to do is to uh, increase the uh, the the. It, it will try to increase the overlap. It may be at the expense of matching with the wrong parameter. But detection is unlikely to be wrong. But the inferred parameters from this process could be uh, quite erroneous. Yes. So, uh, a rough idea of how much lower it can be uh, in order to detect. Yeah, I mean, you you are asking about signal to noise ratio, right? Uh, or in this, yeah, in the same thing. Right. Here it's 10 to the minus 3. Yeah, so this is an example. So I think typical signal to noise ratio in order for you to uh, claim a detection is of the order of 10. That is, that is, the signal should be at least 10 times stronger than. I mean, this should be taken as a, you know, don't, uh, it's not from any uh, actual data. So yeah, this is minus 19. Uh, minus, yeah, this is just to show you some typical. Uh, it could, but of course, it, it is a, a bit tricky thing because you are also integrating. If it's a long signal, you're integrating over time. It can help and so on. It's not a one-to-one -one mapping, but if you're uh, so a good quantifier will be signal noise ratio. And uh, of course, detection is also done by the false alarm uh, no, false alarm rate. These are two different things which you make. So signal noise ratio could be of the order of 10 at least, given the kind of. That's to be read in the cross-code. Yes, yes, yeah.
the idea is that the signal to noise ratio is uh, larger than that. Yes. In the cross correlation, you won't see a clear peak. Yes. Because the peak, you know, like uh, so, yeah, yeah. If you're looking into constant, so if you look into the uh, the, uh, the output, if you look into the output of the match filtering, it will be giving you peaks. Uh, but the, when these peaks exceed certain thresholds, you start looking into them seriously. Especially when you is uh, ten and so on, you know that something seriously is happening. Okay. So this is the detection. So the, you know, the, this is uh, typically with the, this event, which I'm talking about, the binary neutron star was. You know, this happened on. Uh, 17th August 2017, that is what uh, this name is suggesting. This is a very loud signal. This is signal to ratio of the order of 30, which was, which was very lucky to have. If you remember, the binary black hole that we detected first time was of the order of 24. That was itself very, uh, very lucky. But if you want a, a very low mass system to give such a high signal to ratio, you can understand that it should have been very close by, which happened to be because the distance is roughly around 40 megaparsec, as was inferred later. Now the false alarm rate, so that is the prob uh, probability that the instrument can give you a signal like this, you know, uh, uh, with what frequency, you know, instrument according to the estimates, it can give you once in 80,000 years. That is the kind of rough estimate, not rough estimate, it's a, a rigorous estimate, but just giving you the kind of limit on the false alarm rate. And you know, though I'm showing you this picture, which I'll come to, uh, this was detected using the post-neutronian waveforms, which are good enough because the uh, low mass system with a lot of cycles and the post-neutron approximation, you know, the three old, uh, three decade old efforts were all used to detect uh, this system. And the signal, as I was saying, was uh, no, uh, like 100 seconds uh, long. I mean, I'll come to the second. So the first one was around 0 0.1 second. It's been extremely short because it's a very massive system. Whereas this is a low mass system. It is sweeping through the frequency, which we could see. So what is shown here is the three detector, uh, two LIGO detector and the Virgo detector. And it's a time frequency map. So what happens is as the signal is, you know, as the system is progressing, you expect the frequency is increasing as a function of time, as you can see in these two plots. This is a hand, this is a Livingston, this is a Hanford one. You can see that Virgo doesn't really show anything. So you can say that you know Virgo didn't detect. But the fact that Virgo did not detect uh, carries very crucial information about where the source is in the sky, which I will come to later. So I mean, the, you can see a clear track on the Hanford uh, thing and the Livingston one. This is no, this is not how it was detected. It was detected using. Um, um, mass filtering and this is just a way to present the signal uh, in a way that is uh, more uh, more accessible so the fact that there is a, a good signal to ratio loud signal uh, seen both in Hanford and in Livingston and uh, this is signal is uh, the 100 second long which is like the uh, most massive signal uh, I mean no longest signal that you see so this is actually a movie which if you go there if you have a headset you can actually hear the you know if you because the frequencies are of the order of Hertz to kilohertz and so on if you if, if you if your headset if you play this thing you can hear also the signal sort of chirping up so what is shown here is all the signal and the duration as I showed you earlier and on top of it I can if I play this you will see that uh, this is the progression of the signal this is you know seconds is the unit as the signal swept through from you know uh, the starting all the way up to 100 Hertz you can see the other ones becoming extremely uh, low but I think the important thing is that if you had a headset you could uh, hear the thing here uh, you can hear of course the only the last thing you, you can hear but you know this just gives you a relative feel for how long the signal was with respect to all the binary black holes that we had detected so we will wait until uh, uh, it gives you probably a, i don't know where to keep it but yeah No, no, it's a small mass, so that means that it is the frequency uh, that it will merge is high. And that would mean that given the sensitivity starting from 20 hertz or 30 hertz that LIGO is sensitive to, it will be. Uh, it just, uh, okay, so that is the last thought is what you could have heard, but I think you can, if you plug in, you could have heard the whole part. They just to answer your question. So, the, because the, the, if you look into, for example, the uh, frequency at merger, it goes inversely with mass. And the mass for this is small. That would mean the merger frequency is very large. And you know, that means it, it has swept through the whole band that LIGO is sensitive to. And hence, it is longer than the one. Whereas if you have a massive one, like 60 solar mass, it is like very uh, short thing in the thing. So post analysis is good all the way up to merging? No, it is uh, good only up to a regime where, you, you know, when the uh, nonlinear strong if field effect, mm, you know, if you 
merger thing kicks in in the previous one. So I would say that uh, in the first thing, yeah, I mean, uh, it is mostly until here that it would be. So when, you, when this kind of effects nonlinear thing comes, it can, you, you cannot go. Uh, you, you, you cannot trust. It will give you something, but you, know, you, uh, you, you may be having systematic bias in that thing. You would not use it beyond this point. But I think this is where you would need to use numerical relativity. But for this signal, as you, as you can expect, most of the band uh, was only in spiral. And very late was uh, the late merger, which unfortunately we are not sensitive to, in the sense that we know that two neutron stars have merged. But now what is the is it a bigger neutron star or a black hole? We cannot confidently say because we are only sensitive to the uh, in spiral. And uh, the high frequency sensitivity of LIGO is so bad that uh, we cannot say. For example, you could have looked, looked into the ring down mode of the new object, which is different for a massive neutron star as opposed to a black hole. But we, you know, we cannot see the spectrum, uh, at least for this kind of a thing, which is actually a bad thing. But, uh, Uh, n number up to? Uh, okay. How it was the yeah, so I think typically the R of the order of 6M, so now the this is a unit that GR people use. So, uh, three times the short shield Yeah, I think uh, three or, or six times the short shield uh, No, the, the, that is where things will start breaking down roughly. M is uh, M1 plus M1 plus M2 to get a rough estimate. So, uh, H is a strain, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so no, but I think that has nothing to do with that because that will depend upon the distance also. True. So uh, and hence, you know, you cannot uh, that cannot be. Uh, so you're talking about how I mean how far uh, down the thing you trust uh, the dynamics is well modeled by post-Newtonian approximation. Answer is that until six times the short shield radius, you think it should be okay. As you go even closer, uh, it may be breaking. Because the point is that after 6m is like the last innermost stable circle orbit, after that there is no notion of orbit. So hence no velocity is becomes uh, kind of ill-defined, uh, intuitively that is the thing. Beyond that it's numerical. Yes, you, I mean, uh, you, uh, if you want to get it so for, a, for, a, for the binary black hole thing, if you want, you can go further, you, you have to solve the Einstein's equation numerically and get the waveform. That is how that waveform was obtained. And the inside of the horizon does play a role? No, I mean, no. Uh, at least not in the waveform because they, we are all, all sensitive to the the external thing. So one can ask. But does the numerical calculations use that? No, no. So I think they, they there are some clever numerical ways of uh, you know taking care of singularities, which is what they use. So it's still I mean, for them, it's two singularities orbiting and forming one singularity in some sense. That is what the numerical thing would be taking care of. I mean, I, 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 I there are some uh, very clever technique how they can manage it in the numerical uh, thing, though I'm not an expert so, in so that. the final state being a neutron star or black hole is just supposed to be size versus mass? Uh, no, I mean, we don't know the physics of the, I mean. No, 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 I mean, how do you, you don't detect the horizon. You don't detect the horizon. Right, detect exactly. Detect it's, it's radius is larger than the portrait. Yes, yes, exactly, yeah. So within 6M, there is still numerically, there is still stable orbits, is that? Yes, yes. Yeah, and, uh, it can be. So I think six M is like the last thing until we can go. But if you have got a numerical related waveform, you may want to combine both of them slightly earlier so that you don't end up with the systematic bias. Yeah, but I guess I'm asking within six M, there are still stable orbits. Yes, yes, so yes. I mean, after say, 6 m in the uh, yeah. no, because uh, when you solve the because uh, so the problem with the post Newtonian thing is that you are using orbital velocity as a parameter. Right. Once the yeah, they don't care about, uh, the, I mean, they're, they're valid. I mean, if you can start earlier, you can do that, but it's computationally very expensive. If you want to start very early on and you um, uh, do the. 6M, there is still numerically speaking stable orbit. Yes, yes. Okay. I mean, it's not stable orbit. Uh, there's a, I mean, you, you don't need stable orbit, is what I'm saying. You're talking about the dynamics of the two, uh, two black holes. Uh, the stable orbit is required only for analytical modeling, but the dynamics is going on. And something, you know, it may be deformed thing into, into a single thing, some object with a common horizon and so on. They all can be modeled and numerically, but they're not, uh, they don't have to be stable orbits. The, the notion of orbits per se stops uh, roughly at, uh, at six cephal or so, six times uh, the cephal. The orbital notion in a test particle more than a bigger body, there are comparable bodies, so can have center of mass, but that is not analytically different. Yeah. Still be a notion of an orbit. 
center of mass between this? What are you regard the center of mass? Yes. Okay. Okay, so you know you may ask what is so great about it. If you were to go with uh, very prestigious journals, Nature and Science, who are well known for the uh, high quality of refereeing, they don't mind publishing a rumor or uh, one week after the detection, uh, saying that probably LIGO has detected uh, a new class of sources by which they mean uh, you know uh, the binary neutron stars. The excitement is that this you know, if it the rumor happened to be true, they knew that uh, the, it also would produce. Uh, electromagnetic radiation. So usually these black holes just merge and you know that's all done. But the neutron star mergers are supposed to be responsible for a class of gamma ray bursts, which I'll come to in a moment. And in that case, you would see emission ele in electromagnetic window all the way from gamma ray up to radio, and is going to be in a complete, you know, a, a first gravitational waves, and then the whole spectrum of uh, electromagnetic observations are going to be uh, to be important. And this is for the first time probably that one could have seen both gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves from the same source and that was the kind of uh, kind of excitement and uh, you know this is the rumor couldn't have been stopped like i said because at some stage almost every every semi amateur onwards telescopes were looking into one patch of the sky which was oh no and a lot of these uh, telescopes uh, have to make it open where they are looking at and uh, uh, at, you know for quite some time almost everything every other telescope was looking into one galaxy uh, in our universe where this event was occurring and uh, that you know it, it, this couldn't have been, uh, been covered unlike the first detection where only gravitational waves were seen and ligo could have thought that we can all uh, keep it confidential Okay, and you take a, a slight digression in order to um, uh, just make it clear. So the gamma ray bursts are uh, seen from 70s roughly, and these are like intense bursts in gamma rays. So you see that there are uh, bursts of ga uh, gamma rays followed by um, uh, emission in the lower frequencies, X-ray, optical, and probably all the way up to radio. And this, I mean, I'll come to the duration aspect of that, but you know, the kind of uh, to explain the energetics involved in the detection, you have to invoke a highly collimated jet. And the, uh, the jet has to be ultra relativistic, you know, uh, very close to the Lorentz factor of the order of hundreds, which would mean that it is C up to 0.9999C or something that should be the, you know, the, the kind of uh, Lorentz factor of the jet. And the, the uh, most, I mean, the uh, most natural way to explain such a huge uh, uh, kind of energy is to invoke a black hole plus an accretion disk. It is an artistic impression; it's not, uh, it's not an image. And uh, that is what is invoked uh, to explain I mean, how this can be produced, though we don't know. I mean, we, there, there is no way to uh, check because the, you know, what we see is from the gamma ray emitted from the jet itself, which is much later. We don't have anything about the source. So the typical energies, isotropic energies emitted during these uh, few seconds is 10 raised to 49 to 10 raised to 53 Earths, depends upon various things. You know, that's the kind of uh, rays that we have got. So, this gamma ray burst and the, uh, the idea that you invoke is that your this is called a fireball model which is which what explains all the observation uh, which is very complex i mean i'm not an expert in that but what you have is that if you uh, if, if you just you uh, know uh, if you could uh, have a l l lot of energy concentrated into a very small re re region there could be um, the material could produce internal shocks by which means there are shock fronts which will collide with each, with each other and that could be giving you gamma ray burst, so that is the internal shock of the jet will be giving you gamma ray burst, and at some you know, this can be not be sustained for a long time. So as after that it is sweeping through the interstellar medium, and as it goes through it is going to lose its energy to the interstellar medium and you know give you emissions at various frequencies all the way up to uh, from the X-ray uh, all the way up to radio. And this is like a uh, broad picture which explains the prompt emission in the gamma rays and what are called afterglows. You know, the prompt emission is the gamma rays and the X-ray to ra radio is called as afterglows, the gamma ray burst afterglows. So. There are different shock fronts which will be colliding with each other. No, but you're saying internal, so the internal is with respect to There's a jet that is going on. Okay. Within the jet, there could be different shock fronts okay. which will be first c c c colliding with each other. That will be the internal shock. After that, uh, the, uh, the internal shock mechanism is not no longer efficient. Then it starts to burst through the interstellar medium, kind of uh, losing its energy to the part thing in the interstellar medium. Yes, 
Yeah, I mean, I think the intense emission is the, uh, the, the uh, yeah, exactly, because you know, you can see all the way up to radio, when the radio uh, uh, can be seen up to after a year and so on. So that is, uh, uh, yeah. So it's still a very short time we are talking about, only years. No, so I think the, I think the, uh, uh, of course, you know, so a typical time scale is that gamma ray burst, X ray afterglow could come in hours' time, typically three to four hours, and optical in a few days. And all the other thing in days, but the radio is comes which you know because it things would have slowed down considerably by then. But then it can emit for a long time. So I think for at least one uh, one gamma ray burst, the ra radio has also been observed after nine, ten years, which uh, even the GMRT was participated of that. So that is the kind of time scale uh, that you can. For these quasars which are there, the jets are way too long lived. So they are part of this class, right? Yeah, that is a different type of yeah. They can last for million years. Yes. Yeah, but I think that, that I don't think is multi band. So mechanism could be different because we don't uh, see the thing. This is a this. You know, a kind of yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a different kind of. Okay, so uh, this is actually uh, and the figure just when you observe a lot of gamma ray burst and make a histogram of the duration of the burst. When I say duration of the burst, it is the time over which say 90% of their uh, kind of total energy is emitted. Or is, or is observed. So if you make a, a histogram of the duration of the burst, you will see that it is a bimodal distribution. So there is like a sharp cut at two, uh, less than two is you can call it short burst, and greater than two it is long burst. And the long burst are, I mean, uh, uh, you know, because they are more energetic and so on, they have been observed, you know, many of them. And we have seen uh, supernova explosions associated with uh, those long gamma ray bursts, and hence, you know, we, uh, we are we are reasonably sure that uh, the long bursts have to be produced by the death of massive stars when they uh, uh, when the stars die, very m massive stars. They could be giving you the long gamma ray burst. The short gamma ray burst, you know, the kind of energetics does not match with that is predicted by the, um, uh, the by the su uh, su supernova explosion, and it is you know it was unclear what that could be due to initially. And you no, know, those starting from the 90s, if this is a paper by uh, Ramesh Narayan and so on, who, who said that the energetics of a gamma ray burst of this type can be well explained uh, by uh, invoking the merger of two neutron stars. So they knew at that point of time that Hulse Taylor pulsar exists and so on. If they, uh, the end stages of that could give you enough, I uh, know, uh, kind of the energetics uh, required for a gamma ray burst of this type can be very well explained by the, um, by, uh, the collision of two neutron stars. And this, you know, towards the end of the abstract, you can see that you know if uh, they also say that you know if uh, LIGO happens to meet its uh, sensitivity one day, this could be uh, detectable uh, by LIGO also. So this is a paper by 92, and I'm sure that this was uh, I mean this is probably first time they explain the energetics. This is a speculation that existed even earlier, but you know that is this is something which put it on concrete footing. And after that, we have seen many features when the uh, short gamma ray bursts were detected and so on, which are all pointing towards the fact that it it could be a double neutron star merger. But you know there is no way to confirm because what you see in electromagnetic waves is something which happens much later uh, from the jet, and that is there is no way to directly confirm whether they are indeed due to a double neutron star merger or not. So now, if you happen to have joint observations, if you see gravitational waves and the gamma ray burst, you you know you can see a lot of things. For example, if you can confirm the nature of the progenitor, and you can also understand the geometry of the jet. So whether the jet was pointing away from us towards us, you know, uh, the line of how how it uh, how it uh, is oriented with respect to the line of sight, and the structure of the jet. That, for example, across the jet's cross section, this, for example, Lorentz factor is it constant across the uh, across the cross section of the jet, or does it depend upon the angle between the uh, the axis of the jet, and so on, and many other parameters of the jet and the burst. For example, you, you may want to understand the uh, the number density of the ambient medium, which is a very crucial parameter, especially for the radio afterglows and so on. So there are many parameters which goes into the modeling of the afterglows, and these joint observations can significantly improve our understanding about all these uh, I mean, all these aspects. Okay, so that is was a slight digression. So now, what the, what happened is that indeed after the uh, uh, I mean after the detection of the gravitational waves, uh, Fermi detect a uh, long sorry short gamma ray burst. So this is actually the Fermi is a gamma ray satellite in space, and uh, this is actually the and so the, if you, this is shown this is a LIGO trigger. I mean this is a LIGO observation. This is where the merger could have happened. And like 1.74 seconds after that, you can see there is a kind of 
uh, burst. So this burst in the Fermi's on terminology will be really almost subthreshold. It is not uh, typical. Uh, in they, they get even stronger signals, but it is a subthreshold. But it is of course, you know, given that it is associated with the gamma ray burst, sorry, with the gravitational waves, it has to be taken seriously, and they indeed, you know, uh, they indeed send an alert. So this, this, and uh, once this was established, so I think after the first detect, after the detection, we, you know, LIGO uh, actually sends out the circular to the restricted uh, electromagnetic partners who has agreed to follow up any LIGO trigger. And I think we took roughly half an hour to uh, agree upon things and send out a trigger saying that probably we have detected a binary neutron star. And then Fermi uh, sent another circular soon saying that if, you know, just two point, uh, like two seconds after that, we have detected a weak, uh, weak burst of gamma rays. So when these two circulars were, you know, with all the partners were there, then everybody knew that, you know, they, they are up for very interesting thing. So various partners, electromagnetic partners, almost 70 groups who are involved with the thing, they were, you know, they, this event was followed up in almost every possible band of the electromagnetic spectrum with every telescope that people had and so on. So this is, you know, this uh, started a campaign that was extremely, uh, extremely aggressive and uh, extremely intense. But just to come back to this, so this is the uh, typical, so integral is another, uh, another satellite, I did not show it here, a gamma ray satellite which also saw the, big, uh, show, uh, uh, saw the short gamma ray burst roughly two seconds after that. And the, you can now, using the spatial and temporal association, you can ask the question how likely is it that it is indeed, a, uh, you know, it, these two events are in association and the, no, the kind of false alarm probability that they are not is uh, very, very small as you can see. Now, this happened to be, so the gravitational wave amplitude gives you direct measure of the distance and that, you know, the first estimate of the distance was roughly of the order of 50 megaparsec, which is extremely close because the first binary black hole that we detected was like 400 megaparsec. This is the closest gravitational wave sources that we have detected. But also the short gamma ray burst also, we are not, we are not seeing uh, any short gamma ray burst which is so close by, 50 megaparsec is, you know, close by in the astronomical scale. But despite its closeness, <coughs> It was interesting that the energy, uh, the isotropic energy was of the order of 10 raised to 46, which meant it is like roughly three orders of magnitude weaker than a typical short, typical gamma ray burst. So that was a, you know, that was a, uh, that is why the thing happened to be a kind of sub-threshold and that happened to be confusing until for a few days until more extensive campaigns occurred. So this is an important point to keep in mind as we go, uh, go on the top. Roughly isotopic. It's a quadrupolar response, not like the dipole one, which is the EM things are more, uh, yeah. Quadrupole, yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about the electromagnetic follow ups. Okay, this is a figure that I like very much because whenever uh, gravitational wave people give talks about sky localization and if it happen to be astronomers uh, platform, uh, the, you know, the typical uh, source localization that we get is of the order 100 square degree, which is, you know, extremely bad in astronomer sense. So they would say that, you know, what are you going to do with 100, um, kind of 100 square degrees? It's so broad that you cannot do any, uh, any kind of observational, uh, 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 kind of any observation, observational campaign. But it so happened that this time around the story was just the opposite. Because the Fermi uh, burst was so weak that they had a uh, you know, sky map just like all over, and nothing could have been done with just the Fermi sky map. But because three gravitational wave detectors were operating, and the fact that it was very close by, and Virgo uh, especially uh, did not see anything. Of course, uh, Virgo should have the data is very low signal to ratio one. That's why we did not see it. But the fact that you know there, there are different detectors. So how you do uh, source like localization is uh, using triangulation, depending upon the time of arrival of the two detectors. And there are blind spots. If you look into the antenna pattern functions, there are spots from which, you know, you, uh, which every detector is not, you know, for every detector there are blind spots, which, you know, that means you cannot see that thing at all, because it's, uh, it's like uh, totally, you cannot, it's totally blind. So the fact that it happened to be in one of the, likely to be very close to one of the blind spots of Virgo, give very u useful information. And what is shown here is, this is a Fermi uh, sky map, I mean, the kind of lo localization. And this is an integral sky, which is like, again, a totally, uh, a totally off, though kind of complementary. But now what is shown here is that the, this uh, the light green patch is the LIGO, two LIGO detectors, uh, how they could localize it, couldn't distinguish between this up and down degeneracy. 
But once you add Virgo, this is the LIGO Virgo region, which is like 28 square degree, which was quite reasonable for most of the telescope to follow it up. So it so happened that the LIGO Virgo localization uh, using gravitational waves was much better than the electromagnetic waves, and uh, th that is because the, it is a weak burst uh, compared to the typical uh, uh, kind of typical Fermi thing. So that meant that if you know if this hap such events happen with Fermi, not having gravitational wave association, this wouldn't be followed up. But that also means that probably there is a population of this kind of a burst which will have to be uh, you know, seen in future whether you know, did Fermi miss a lot of them because they are sub, so, uh, so sub-threshold and EM follow-ups are not possible. But that is uh, something to be, uh, to be, so these are like uh, a thing, but I think this is something to be kept in mind that the extremely good localization uh, with consistency is what give you information about uh, you know, what, made the, uh, uh, what made the electromagnetic follow-ups to be possible. Yeah, we're good. Didn't see, but I'm saying that uh, there is uh, no. Yeah, yeah. So I think the uh, so when you do the detection, you're looking into signal to noise ratio. So then, as I showed you, there's like a you know there was no clear pattern, unlike the chirp pattern in LIGO. But once you do a, um, a sky so sky localization is like you want to estimate theta and phi using the data, and that is done coherently. What you do is that you add up the LIGO data and Virgo data coherently, and the new, the coherently combined data is analyzed uh, for the thing. And there, you know, if there's a signal there, and the information about the sky localization is all encoded. So if the Virgo did not see it, because it happened to be at the blind spot of, of the Virgo, that information will go in to the sky localization, which was what has helped. So in some sense, Virgo did not detect, but you know, the data was used to do the sky localization, and it's improved. No, there's a, there's a kind of dumb, the, uh, the quadrupolar thing can have a thing. It depends on the orientation of the source. Yes. So I, I'm saying that. Information about not just where it is, but also orientation. Yeah, so, sure, sure, because the, the, uh, the, uh, you have coherently combined data, which you uh, do uh, to estimate every part of distance, uh, the inclination angle, theta, phi, xi, all, all the angles will be uh, estimated. Yeah, indeed. But I'm saying that the, but I think inclination is something which they don't care about. First, they want the, uh, the uh, no, sky, uh, the location in the sky. For EM follow-ups. Right? Yeah, the the will be changes, then blind spots are going to change. Now you are using the fact that Virgo has a blind spot. Well, no. You with Virgo has a blind spot. So this is not the Virgo one. The LIGO and Virgo has seen and Virgo has not seen. Sorry. Exactly. Uh, li two LIGOs have seen. Yeah. Exactly. Therefore Virgo is in the blind spot of that source. Yes. So source orientation is related to that. Yeah, so there will be degeneracy between the source orientation and the angle which will come and might um, that, that can affect our English angle estimation. But it, I'm saying this error bar, it's not a point, right? So there's still a huge error bar. 28 square degree is still bad uh, in any kind of thing. But it's much better than the other one which uh, came from the gamma rebus. Sorry, uh, the gravity wave source orientation that will be correlated with the jet structure and all that. Right? Yes. In the for, for me, see that also has been correlated and all that. Yes, yeah, so I'll come to that. So the, uh, so the, uh, the uh, if the jet was pointed along you or slightly away, is going to play a role, and I mean, I'll come to I mean, how we can disentangle. So, inclination angle information, which is the angle between your line of sight and the black hole axis, first can be inferred with some error bar, but that was used also. I'll come to that in a moment. Okay. So next thing that you would expect for a gamma ray burst is that in a few hours time you would expect X-ray afterglow. That is a typical thing of a gamma ray burst. But you know, despite uh, X-ray follow-ups by Hubble tel Space Telescope and Swift and so on, there was no X-ray afterglow for a few days. So that was a first mystery. So the first mystery was it was very weak despite being so close. Secondly, X-ray uh, uh, X-ray afterglows were not seen even for days. So the first one which was detected was optical. Optical, not afterglow. It was say optical detection, uh, and this was by. So this is a swap. Uh, was the first one which detected it. So a swap is a 40-inch telescope. You know, it's not a big one, but they are aimed to do some survey of the supernova and so on. They detected a uh, first tra optical transient uh, uh, at the location you know, within the sky uh, map that was given. And they could also associate a galaxy. And this is now you know, the name of the galaxy is NGC 4993. So what is shown on the left is a map by Hubble telescope of this galaxy on uh, April 28th. And what is shown here is the same thing. You, know, the, you can see that there is a source here, this optical transient that was detected by SWAP. It is not just the SWAP. You know, after almost independently, many DECAM and many other optical telescopes which were pointing at the sky uh, found uh, the, this optical transient. 
Now, the optical transient, you know, the fact that X-ray afterglow was not found, and optical, it can be afterglow from the jet of the thing. So, the spectral nature and so on indicated that the optical detection is consistent with what is called a kilonova. So what I'm showing here is the following. So this is a black hole that was formed probably by the neutral star merger. And when it's formed, there are the jet is going out. This is a beam jet. And it, you, know, you, you, you can see only if you are just along the axis of the jet. If you are uh, totally away, you may not even see it. But what you will see is any emission from the ejector. So when this explodes, there may be a near isotropic ejection of, uh, uh, you know, ejection of uh, uh, the material from the new, new neutron star. And this neutron star, so I think this is the, 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 the way in which you produce is that the, uh, the crust of the neutron star can have, um, uh, there can be uh, high atomic mass nuclei. And now they're exploding and they're going, you know, they may be going with the velocity of the order of 0.1 uh, c or something, which is not you know, slow. And then there's neutrons coming from the neutron star. So it actually g gives you a way to combine the uh, high atomic mass nuclei at the crust of the neutron star with the flux of neutrons which are going by due to, due to the explosion. And it's an ideal way to uh, generate uh, the high, uh, the heavy elements. You know, uh, if you want to go, uh, go above iron, this is an ideal mechanism to, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the kind of um, uh, circumstances is ideal to have very heavy elements. And there can be, you know, in the process, it, there may be decay of uh, nuclear, I mean, basically it's called R process, uh, is, a, is a, like a new, uh, ra uh, radio decay, radioactive decay, which will have its own spectral lines. And, you know, this has been predicted long ago in 99 by Lee and Pachinsky, who predicted that, you know, such a thing will be very ideal situation to form uh, the uh, this the kind of heavy elements and uh, consequently there will be emission in optical and UV uh, they predicted which can be calculated I guess uh, uh, visually more isotropic so you know you if you, even if you don't happen to be on the jet uh, axis you'll be able to detect it so this was the you know all the all the features that was detected was consistent with the optical and later UV and so on this is uh, this confirms the existence of what is called a kilonova it's called a Kironova because it is weaker than supernova or some 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 kind of thing. There are different mechanisms. But anyway, this is basically the Kironova is the radioactive decay from the material that is ejected and uh, you know from the decay of um, uh, and which leads to the formation of heavy, uh, kind of heavy elements above iron that is platinum, gold, and so on. So with the identification of the host galaxy, we could get a distance estimation even closer if you use redshift and get an estimate. It, you know, it was fine. Like, you know, the thing is pretty good estimate about 40 megaparsec, which is you know which is much better than the gravitational waves were. Again, due to various degeneracies, it was not very accurate, but roughly it is consistent within the arabas of the gravitational wave observation. So this was the first optical. Uh, this is the first uh, electromagnetic counterpart uh, to a gravitational wave that was found by multiple telescopes almost at the same time. No, I'm saying that uh, the, the mystery is that we don't. The, if you take the existing uh, um, existing estimate about the abundance of the heavy elements, you need to explain how they were formed. And uh, the one mechanism is supernova explosion, but then uh, they have to be so frequent and so you know, so fine-tuned to get them. So you knew that probably you need another mechanism to explain it, and probably if this is so frequent, it can explain naturally. You know, you don't have to rely on too much on the supernova thing to get it. Of how many binary neutron storm merges could be done? Yes, I think uh, so. Okay, the the you're talking about the amount of uh, abundance selects on Earth, gold, how much is there, and so on. That. Yeah. So, they, but then there's a fraction, right? When how many of them are there? So, but they independently, you you have seen one event during this thing will itself give you a kind of estimate which is stronger than that, which is there, of course. So it is combined with that estimate, and this one is what would give you uh, the com you know, saying that it could be consistent. There's no need to invoke anything more on that. Yes, yes, exactly. So in various things, very much consistent with uh, almost light curves are very much consistent with what is predicted. Actually, it is not the first uh, time you're seeing kilonova. In 2013, there was a short gamma reverse where they detected a UV uh, thing. But of course, you know, it was only UV. It was very, you know, there were only very few data points. So it was not, you know, people suspected it's probably uh, the f uh, kind of evidence for this kilonova. But here, it is like, you know, this is confirmed with everything, uh, you know, all the bands and so on that it uh, agrees with every feature that you can think of and that have been predicted for this kilonova. Other than that one event, we have never seen the spectral lines from this kilonova earlier. 
Yeah, because I think the the reason is that uh, uh, th this are actually isotropic emission and very weak. So unless they happen to be close by, so the one which was uh, which happened in 2013 was probably uh, at a distance of a point redshift of point one or something, which is rather close by. So you cannot see them uh, too far off, just because you know it's not unlike the gamma ray, but it's not a beamed emission. Uh, no, no, this is a way to invoke it. There is no, I mean, uh, usually you, I mean, it, it depends. I don't know. So I am saying that, uh, you know, it's a, uh, because usually the jet is invoked with the black hole plus accretion disk. People use it as a, uh, as a way to end product. So typically numerical simulations have been done and they show that, you know, uh, two neutron stars, uh, we have seen black holes forming in the numerical simulations, but it can also go through a phase when there is in between this hypermassive neutron stars. Uh, which is uh, just a, a temporary phase lasting for, I don't know, a very brief thing, then it might be unstable and then it collapses to a black hole. So whether uh, this existing observer, the one which we saw has undergone through that stage, we don't know because that stage we have no sensitivity to seeing the gravitational wave signal. Yes, uh, yes, exactly. Uh, uh, there is no because you know the uh, the, amplitude and the, the, the inclination angle and the chirp signal, I guess, right? Right, because I think I will come to that because you know the amplitude contains mass, distance, and inclination angle. The mass comes in the phasing, you can estimate it very accurately, so you can break the degeneracy between distance and mass, but the inclination angle doesn't come anywhere except the amplitude. So that's the stronger degeneracy is between the uh, line of sight and the distance, which still remains uh, to be thing. So that is the independent estimate. Uh, you know, because you're not re relying on anything else and together you can use to constant Hubble constant so that will come to towards end of my talk how we can uh, how long does this optical translation last? Um, I think a few hours I think but, no, but I think not optical transient so I think combinedly it might have last for a few days the, this, uh, the UV optical and IR uh, combinedly would have lasted for a day or two, I don't know, to be honest, I, mean, I, I don't know the number. But I think I want, this is observed after, you know, the, uh, after the event was, after trigger it was observed after uh, some nine hours or something. It also had to do with the fact that, uh, you know, it, it, it has to be night in places where there are good telescopes. So, and it happened to be, uh, it happened to be night in the Asia region, but you know, they have to wait until it's uh, night in Chile, where some of these telescopes were there. Okay, so that is about the optical, but finally X-ray was detected. So it, after nine days, uh, since Hubble and Swift couldn't do it, Chandra has uh, ability to, uh, Chandra telescope has ability to uh, probe deeply into a patch of sky and they detected. So roughly nine days after, they, uh, Chandra found it and it, it, it has got a higher sensitivity into a deeper, you know, and able to deep probably. So what it means is that the X-ray uh, mission was uh, delayed by uh, uh, some amount and is weak because, you know, uh, if both were there, that's all what we can say. So Chandra observations were confirmed that there's X-ray afterglow. That's the first afterglow that you would expect from the signal, which was delayed and this and was weak. But it's also strange, right? Can you see optical before X-ray? But optical is not from the jet. See, the, the, so the, I mean the answer to the, the, if I break the suspense, the, if the jet is launched away from you, you uh, and jet is expanding, you will see the emission only after it starts crossing your line of sight. So it causes a delay, whereas the kilonova is an isotropic exp uh, explosion, and you see it almost immediately. No, I think it, it just goes from uh, UV, optical, and uh, IR. I think because that depends upon the transition, uh, the nuclear thing which happens. Uh, not. No, I think there are. I mean, all, all the Swift and so on has got uh, UV things on board. So I think there are a lot of uh, UV things. Even Astrosat has got it, but I think Astros, I mean, the Indian telescope. But I think it so happened that uh, I mean, uh, it has got X-ray UV capabilities. But uh, due to its design, I think it went. It was behind the sun or something. It couldn't just see the whole thing. It unfortunately uh, kind of oriented. It is not tuned towards this kind of observation, so it is not uh, taken care of. So, but uh, yeah, but I think there are a lot of U UV telescopes which can do this. So uh, after that, there's a radio. So radio was again an interesting thing. It uh, after a few days, uh, the uh, Jansky Very Large Array uh, Telescope detected a radio. But then some other group went on and looked for it after uh, after a couple of days. It was not there. 
so there was a lot of confusion why you know it is usually the ra radio detection lasts for like, you know years like i said it is very unlikely that something will fade so fast but then again after some days they went again they saw it again so it so turned out that there was some atmospheric turbulence which was masking the radio during that second time of observation and you know now we are seeing radio which i when i last heard it is still the light curve it is you know it's going up it is still increasing its uh, thing so i'm sure that you know the radio observations over a longer time is going to give us more information about various uh, about aspects of the source okay so uh, there was a very uh, extensive campaign for neutrinos so this ice cube and Terrace and the Pierre Auger observatory were involved in it and also I think the Himalaya and Chandra telescope in Hanley was also involved. So I think there were multiple telescopes but I think finally we were, you know, they did not see any of them. Which is probably consistent with the fact that the distance is 50 megaparsec and, you know, they, they, you know, they may not, because I don't, I, I, I don't know whether it's even expected to see anything which is uh, so far off. But anyway, the bottom line is that we did not see any neutrinos, though it would have been ideal if you saw that. Okay, so now I've got five minutes to go, so I, I'll, I'll probably choose. Um, so, so, so kind of in short, the GW170817 and the GRB170016A, 17 this A comes because there were two GRBs on the same day. Uh, the, the, the second GRB could have been, sh should be feeling really bad. Uh, you know, the, but the, so this joint observations is probably the, you know, the most extensive astrophysical campaign ever uh, has happened. And maybe the only one which would be next to it would maybe the 1987 supernova, which happened in our galaxy uh, in 87. But you know, it probably led to the most extensive uh, kind of observational campaign, which led to a lot of things. OK, so now I'm going to uh, really hurry through things. Um, so this is the important result. So this is the first is the mass of the neutron star. So we have got uh, estimate of the mass. But now from the gravity, this is only gra gravitational waves. So the problem with the mass estimation is that it is degenerate with the, as, uh, the assumption about the spin. So if you think that uh, you know, the neutron star can have spin in binary, neutron stars in binaries can have spin of up to 0.9, then you know, the, the, kind of, um, the range is too huge. But if you think that the uh, uh, spin prior uh, is restricted to less than 0 0.05, which is what we have seen in all the binary, binary neutron stars in our galaxy, uh, this, you know, then the estimates are quite good. This only this uh, this region. So that you know, this is the kind of estimate that you would get. But it's, you know, this is typically in the same ballpark as you would expect for a typical uh, uh, typical neutron star. Why, why is the spin? Low? Why do we expect the spin to be low? No, because th th this is a kind of. I mean, we don't expect. I'm saying all the uh, one dozen or so uh, uh, double pulsars, uh, double neutron stars in our galaxy that we have seen. We have seen that the, the spin components are low. That's an observational fact. Whereas probably this one is probably the, if you take isolated neutron stars, we have seen them spinning uh, at a high rate, uh, even up to uh, uh, a spin of about 0.9. But these are two extremes which we consider. There is no, you know, if you use prior. And in the, since mass and spins are, you know, the gravitational wave facing has both mass and spin and they're very strongly degenerate, it does, you know, the assumption you make about the spins make a difference to the estimation of the mass. Why should we it? Sorry? Yeah, so I think th this is you know, sharply cut. So usually one will be cut off. So here, we are that uh, the there are uh, total mass is cut. So the m is equal to m1 plus m2. There's a range of m1 and m2, and upper thing is cut off. That is why these you know these sharp cuts are due to that. But no, but I think if this thing is uh, due to the uh, no, why should it be? But these are posterior distributions. I'm saying that uh, so if, if you yeah, this is a data. So data, if, you know, if, if it's showing to be, you know, the uh, M1 to be this one, and the blue one, this is this one. There is no reason to be there. And it, of course, there are sharp cutoffs come due to whatever boundary thing we are putting on the thing. Yeah. Sorry. Spin, right? Yes. Yes. So I think this Z component. That's what it's called. Z component of the spin. And which is a reasonable assumption for a binary neutron star system, I suppose. Uh, the. Yeah, but dynamically forming a double neutron star is a challenge, isn't it? I, uh, can, I mean, how? I, I, I understand. Yeah. So I think uh, the, that, uh, yeah. Uh, to, we do assume that it's, a, it's aligned spin is assumed, and the magnitude with the aligned spin is 0 0.05 and 0 0.9. We don't know. Pulsars are uh, until, unless. I mean, unless we see the uh, electromagnetic emission, we will not see, right? So. Because we can see, we looked into it after the emission, not before. So if you, and also, people are making surveys and. Yeah, they just do parts. So, first, we have seen all the 
Ah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so most everything is in Milky Way. That's true. OK, so this is the equation of state. I'm really sh uh, shooting. Maybe I'll take five more minutes and quickly wind up. Uh, so, uh, so now, OK, so this is uh, uh, because the neutron stars have got an equation of state, unlike black holes, uh, you do expect to see its signature in the gravitational wave form, and hence you can estimate it. So this, understandably, are the finite, uh, finite size effect is something which comes towards the late stages when they are close by, because when they are, uh, when they are far away, one cannot exert tide on the each other. So they are higher post-Newtonian orders in the post-Newtonian expansion, say 10 pn, sorry, 5 pn. And um, hence, you know, but they're still there. But the, uh, that is how you estimate it. You use the waveform and estimate what could be that. So the, the, estimate, the thing that we estimate is the following. So now, if uh, epsilon ij is an external field that is steadily deforming a neutron star, and if qij is the induced quadruple moment on the neutron star, the relation between them involves this factor lambda. This is what called the tidal deformability parameter. This is the ability, I mean, how much by an external, external potential can you deform a neutron star. So you can make it dimensionless by dividing by M5. Uh, yeah, of course, I'm using geometrical units, so there'll be a lot of, uh, if you start uh, comparing dimension, you might end up in trouble. So what it means is that if you have a, a stiff equation of state, uh, you expect lambda to be high and uh, the object to be less compact. If you have a soft equation of state, uh, you expect lambda to be small and the object is compact. So what is shown is, again, the two spin priors. So what we estimate actually is a linear combination of the two tidal deformability. So you got lambda 1 and lambda 2 as a linear combination. And that is mapped onto the uh, lambda 1, lambda 2 plane that is here. So the, the density of this contour, as, it, as you can see, it becomes less and less red as you go out, shows the probability of where, you know, where it is higher and where it is lower. And you can see that the high preference is towards low values of lambda 1. And here of, of also, and so you can see that these regions can be almost completely ruled out. And what you can do is that you can take an equation of state that you know and compute how the lambda will be in the, you know, how the lambda will be. And a lot of the favorite, I don't know, favorite or not, I don't have a feel for it, but a lot of the well-known equation of states uh, which could, which, which we thought could be consistent uh, is, can be almost ruled out based on what we have seen, the MS1 and MS1B, though I don't have any intuition for that. But uh, they are the one which, uh, which sort of produces stiff equation of state. They are mostly ruled out. And it seems to suggest that you know, the low lambda is mostly what is preferred. And uh, that would is consistent with the neutron star having a rather soft equation of state. No, so the lambda tilde, which is a combination of that is what is observed. And we map it onto the you know, 3D thing, we map it onto lambda 1, lambda 2. OK, so this is the Hubble constant. I think uh, you know, almost uh, broke the suspense. So yeah, you've got uh, distance from gravitational waves and redshift from the optical counterpart. So you know, Schutz had written a paper in 86 saying that if you, uh, you know, eventually once you have a detection, you can do this. And then the only thing that remains is the Hubble constant, local Hubble constant uh, of the thing. So since you observed z from, uh, from the optical counterpart and dl from gravitational waves, you can estimate uh, Hubble constant. But if you know Hubble constant, you'll be asking, you know, there's already a tension between the su uh, su uh, supernova measurements and the Planck measurements. And you, may, you, you might ask whether this uh, resolves that puzzle. Answer is not. Uh, so I think uh, this is the, our posterior distribution, which is sort of consistent. You know, this is the green one is the Planck, and the orange one is from the Reese, which is the uh, su su supernova one. And you know, the, within the error bar, you know, we cannot uh, say anything. It's consistent with kind of both in some sense. So the Hubble constant that we observe is 70 plus, some plus 12 minus 18, whatever. So the bottom line is we can estimate the Hubble constant. Which we can improve as we get more. We can uh, we can make the distributions to be narrower, combining the posteriors. But it doesn't, uh, as of now, it doesn't help you break the degeneracy between or the uh, break, break this tension between the supernova and the uh, and the Planck. Okay, so we can do strong field test of gravity because this ideal situation where gravity might deviate from predictions of GR because there these are for example scalar tensor theories and so on fall into a category where uh, they, where, where things depend upon equation of state and here it, is, there, it has got equation of state but unfortunately we have not I mean we are still analyzing the data to look for deviations and you know very preliminary estimates shows that you know some of the things could be improved but we have to wait because these are a long signal and any analysis takes long time <coughs> Okay. 
So the quick thing, so the fact that we have seen a light and gravitational wave simultaneously, we can put a difference between the velocity of the gravitational wave minus velocity of light um, by this thing. So this is a bound that you can put. And you know this, this I heard is like 10 orders of magnitude better than any other bound that has been put because you know it's very uh, rare to see two of them because uh, all the other things are indirect. So this is the bound that we you know. This is a V uh, gravitational wave minus V E M by V E M is now bounded from both sides, superluminal and subluminal, to very uh, high accuracy. Simply using the fact that we have we have seen both light and gravitational waves from the same source. Okay, I will stop here. I think I will just quickly go to the point that she had. So I want to mention that this is the amplitude of the gravitational waves. The polarization depends upon the iota, which was mentioned, and dl. This is the degeneracy that we are talking about, and uh, you know this is just the uh, line of sight, and um, this is one of the constraining factors. And gravitational wave observations show that the viewing angle, you know, which is like iota or mi minimum of one uh, iota and variety minus iota, because iota uh, is sensitive to the uh, the the way in which it is rotating. So this you take the minimum. So that seems like you know indeed it is preferring the off-axis uh, thing. So this uh, this confirms that it has to be it, it should have been off-axis. And if it's off-axis, it explains almost every feature that you have seen. For example, this is the this is the uh, if it is off-axis, the prompt emission is what I have seen. So the prompt emission as a function of the viewing angle. You know uh, it can be. Uh, it can dip very sharply up to two or three orders of magnitude, which is what we have seen in the prompt emission. And you know, this is uh, this light curve can be of different types, and you know, they 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 also consistent with what we have seen: the late uh, rise of the X-ray and the late ob non-observation of optical afterglow, and so on, is consistent with the fact that it is off-axis. So that's all. I think uh, the the yeah. So I think this is basically the weak prompt emission, uh, late and weak X-ray detection. And the radio detection is all consistent and pointing towards the fact that uh, this, uh, together with the uh, viewing angle observation, is consistent with the fact that we have seen something which is pointing away from us, and that is why it was all uh, dim or uh, late. Okay, this is again the, this. I think I, I will skip it. So to summarize, uh, you know, we have this first detection of gravitational waves from the merger of two neutron stars. First confirmation that neutron star mergers can produce gamma ray burst. Short, uh, uh, short gamma ray burst, and there is another thing that you know even neutron star black hole mergers can produce in principle gamma ray burst, and we may have to wait uh, for LIGO or uh, third observation run to begin to see if we start seeing such signals. But the, uh, de definitely double neutron star mergers can produce short gamma ray burst. And kind of first constraints on uh, equation of state from gravitational waves is another important thing. The Hubble constant and the uh, off-axis measurements uh, of the thing was also possible because we had the joint observations, of both of the gamma ray burst and the follow-up as well as the gravitational waves. So I think with that, I'll stop and take questions. I'm sorry for exceeding time almost by 10 minutes. Sorry. Thank you. You cannot because I think the end one end of the post radius spills over to 2.5 and so on. So that also you cannot say. Strictly speaking. Yeah, so <laughs> I forced him. Yeah. For the new neutrons of black hole bet, is it? No, I was quite interested in it. Okay. Give you some inside information. Not inside. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think th this will be revised because uh, this is a very, you know, this is a long signal. We are going to revise the estimate. Maybe future papers will have a more tighter constraint, which could rule out the thing. But in principle, one cannot rule out. I mean, this end, it is very likely to be given the thing, but not uh, completely. Equation state is only the gravitational wave part. It does affect in terms of the matter thrown out and uh, mostly the. Kiranov observation, and I think the, there have been way. For example, the, um, uh, the there's a mapping between the mass ejected as a function of equilibrium state, which is uh, which is actually empirical from numerical simulations, and they they're consistent with what are estimated. But you know both of them are oh, got huge error bars. But I think um, getting the equilibrium state just from the electromagnetic uh, thing is not also uh, easy, and also the there is no independent estimation of the mass ejected. That also have to compute from the light curves and so on. So it's a mapping of the light curves to uh, mass ejected, and the mass ejected to the total mass, which will give you the equation of state. It's a very indirect thing, but in principle, yeah, it, it, it has imprints everywhere, but not easy to use uh, to inf you know uh, to check anything. Suppose you pretend that that black hole was a neutron 
Of the final the thing? Original, the, 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 the is to black hole, black hole was the first observation. Yes. The light was first one. Yes. Suppose you pretend that that's a neutron star. A neutron star and black hole. Yeah, but you don't see the horizon. Right. Yeah, yeah. So you pretend that there's an equation of state. Yes. What equation of state will be consistent with that? You're talking about the binary black holes and assume that binary black holes were not black holes? What? Yeah, that's what you see. Yeah, I'm saying suppose you had to pretend that there is some exotic equation state, it's a state and object of that size. Like uh, the, uh, take the old binary black hole detection yeah, yeah. and pretend that the black holes were not black holes but uh, some neutron stars. Yeah, there's some equation of states. Yeah, so I think, of course, neutron stars cannot, and I think maximum mass, there is fundamental constraint. But uh, you have a valid point. You, uh, there are this new thing about black hole mimickers. You know, there, there can be boson stars and gravel stars and so on, which are like black holes, very massive object, where people can show that probably uh, it can have an equestral state. It can give you, depending upon the compactness, it can mimic many properties of the black hole, but the tidal deformabilities could be of the order of hundreds to thousands. So, in principle, one can actually use it, you know, use the gravity observations to constrain those tidal deformabilities and put constraints on the parameter space of uh, those black hole makers. That is actually very, because people have not started computing, because almost everything you compute now can be checked. Uh, so it is actually an active research area uh, to come up with um, uh, more improved models for that and waveforms and so on. Right. The same thing. It's like a sliding. The, there's a uh, the long signal. No, no. The complex size is pretty some waveform, right? Yes. How many cycles the typical template? No, because you you just give the masses. So you're giving masses and spins, and no, your data first you have to have detection, right? Yes. No, I'm saying that so. I just got some noise and I have some template which is a finite size. Yes. It's a and keeps sliding to see whether it matches that. Yes. What is the size of the template but, compared to that? Yeah, so a size of the template is decided by the. So you're giving the upper cutoff and lower cutoff frequency right. and the masses. Right? And the masses you keep changing. That is how you uh, give a template bang. And given the upper cutoff frequency is fixed, you change mass, it is almost in the, as long as it can. So that is taken care of automatically. So then you match the entire. Length exactly. 100 seconds to almost, yeah. But yeah, no, yes. Not in the optical. No, so that is what uh, was uh, asking. So it is, you know, there may be the indirect imprints, but the direct imprint is in gravitational waves because the finite size effect is a term. It's like a five pn term in the positive turn expansion, which is which can be measured at least though not very accurately. That is what we used. So it is more direct than anything else. Uh, but yeah. No, we re we should ten. So. <laughs> the spins which are the spins are in dimension. So it's like you know uh, the dimensionless units. So it goes between minus one and one. Depends. The magnitude goes between zero and one. So the maximum thing is like the limit of the Kerr black hole thing. That's one, and non-spinning is zero. So this is, um, yeah, so you, you can actually, if you know the angular momentum, it is a combination of G, M, C, and J, I mean the angular momentum parameter. It's a particular combination. So J by M also. J, yeah, J, G, yeah. Like J of like M also. Yes, the A by, yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>